Welcome to this video. Today I have a very special interview guest I was looking forward to very much. He's a super experienced coffee roaster and coffee professional. We're going to talk about coffee roasting, about green coffee, and um, also about the Link Nucleus Link Roaster. And uh, the person I'm talking about is Sam Cora. Hello, Sam. Nice to have you. Hey. Hey, Inger. How you doing? Thanks for having me. So, Sam, maybe to give people a bit of um, a background or an idea about who you are and what you've done in coffee, can you share a bit your story on your your coffee story and what you're doing now at the moment? Yeah, of course. So, to the present day, if I'm thinking I've been working in coffee for 19 years, um, my original background was actually to go into wine. I was, um, it's my father's business to be, He's a wine exporter. I was trained from a young age to go into more of a sommelier style practice. Uh, and I guess I accidentally fell into coffee in the beginning. Um, I think like all of us, the draw card was around latte art. Uh, I grew a passion for it. And early on, that's what drew me into the competition scenes. I had a lot of videos. If people want a good laugh, go look up a video channel, back 555 and the faceless individual pouring patterns uh, with myself. Um, but I think that really opened up specialty coffee for me. Um, I met a lot of great people up from a very small town in Australia um, and specialty coffee was really just emerging. So from last AR, it took me to the competition world. From competition world, it made me realize that I didn't know a lot about the back end of coffee, how it's produced, where it comes from. Um, the roasting and I, I'm always intrigued uh, to you know working for on a coffee it was a very small company at that time I think four employees and you know was thrust into roasting at a very early age and a time and era where there wasn't the same level of detail and knowledge that we now have the luxury of so I think at least my understanding of roasting was very hands-on and you fail every time and you learn from it and then you react. And I think from that, it gave me a healthy appreciation to always look for different ways in which we can manipulate the roast and develop a style and understanding of, you know, the reaction and counter reaction and to go against your gut and, and what it tells you and just explore. Um, I was roasting for probably head roaster for honor for around a decade. Um, and then you know, in a more recent role, stepped out into green purchasing and coffee programming. Um, as I said, mentioned, very heavily invested in competition space. Um, I've worked with several baristas in my time uh, and brewers, uh, which has been always very rewarding. Um, some of them going on to success. I think we roasted coffee or I roasted coffee for three world champions now. Like, yeah, not, not that that really matters, but it's kind of always nice to see um, when you have a theory and, a, and an approach to a coffee and it's, it's rewarded, you know, by the excellent work of the people behind uh, presenting it. Um, myself, I was a competitor. I competed in brewing competition in 2017. Uh, I was the Australian champion that year and, and went on to second place in Budapest. Uh, and that was a educational exercise because our company was terrible at roasting filter coffee uh and my whole competition drive was for feedback like as you'll hear from the link story i'm very driven by feedback and data um because from that i think we all can learn and improve what we do so it's a little bit about me um yeah nice so you've been roasting for, you say, more than a decade and uh, probably coffee roasting or also the coffee culture in, in Australia or around the world has changed quite a lot uh, in the meantime. So uh, what is a bit like, what were the biggest learning that you had during your roasting, your roasting time? Yeah. The biggest thing you said you've seen. Yeah, I, I think the thing for me, it's kind of like when I was roasting, I imagine it's what it's like before uh people who came before uh and, and are used to the internet um because when i was roasting you know you may have had a thermal couple hooked up to a reader to give you a readout but there was no such thing as predictive roasting roasting technology monitoring live kind of software that we now have all the luxury of 
you know, ROR and, and all those wonderful terminologies and understandings that we have now of the different phases of roasting were very undeveloped in a raw platform. Um, and I think, yeah, it was very intuitive base roasting. Um, and what I think that we've witnessed now is the evolution of intu intuition, but also pairing that with science and data and readouts and just relatable, um, relatable context of what we can visualize to actually have a better insight of what's actually happening and make educated decisions, you know, on, on how to improve. Yeah. What is kind of, what are the most important, what, what is your approach to coffee roasting? What are the most important factors you look at or what are yeah. the kind of concept you have behind finding a, a great coffee profile or great coffee? I think the idea is, you know, obviously the initial aspects of being a good roaster is experience. I think that when you approach a challenge and you drop that coffee into the roaster, you're really reacting to what's happening and, and knowing how to react to what's happening or what's about to happen you know, takes, takes the skill set, I believe in roasting and, and that's where you can draw upon all of the lessons that you've learned. Um, my approach to roasting is essentially about standardization and repeatability. Mm -hmm. Uh, I like the idea that we can find, uh, an aspect or an extraction method that we enjoy and prepare a sample that will suit that method, regardless of the process, the country the variety, et cetera, just to make it easier for the end user, whether it's yourself or a client or a customer or, you know, a cafe to have the best and easiest way to move through the coffee world and all the different coffees that we can enjoy. Um, I would say, you know, my theories behind roasting are very time driven based, connecting that to, you know, reaction and taste and extraction and you know, if we're to sum it up, I would say roasting to a extraction point um, before just having to adjust to a recipe based on your roast. Mm. And when you're doing this um, roast for the for the coffee champions that you've been talking about, I mean, how you how to approach this? Are you going to try um, dozens of roasts, or do you have already an idea in your in your mind, or is it more about the green coffee? What is kind of the magic behind? Doing yeah, coffee? see, see, that's an interesting one because it's a case by case um, kind of interaction. You know, I would say some of the best coffees I've ever roasted in my life have only ever had one go at it. Um, my own competition coffee, I had four kilos uh, at that time. The minimum batch size for our roaster was a 15 kilo roast it was was four kilos before the thermocouple would actually drop out and i didn't have a smaller roaster to be able to roast on so that was kind of all prayers and hope on getting that right and just hold your breath until the end and and you, and you drop it and cool it um that was an interesting uh kind of approach because as i said at that time i was looking to rethink and adjust how i was roasting i was very heavily based at least from my own um competition copy on development percentage and that number needing to be above 20 percent uh in order to make that profile work but actually shortening the time frame um to make sure it was still vibrant and clean uh and where i actually changed my theory quite a lot for filter roasting was development before first crack you know, the phases that we have, the mallard phases, the drying phases, the sugar browning phases, and focusing on them as being quite important aspects to the development of the coffee's qualities and not just that development percentage number after. Uh, I developed a theory from that, which really stems that in my own personal belief and let this be known to anyone watching this, that there is no right or wrong way to roast coffee. There's several different interpretations and everyone has the ability to get great, you know, results out of whatever their theory is. But the way in which my brain worked and how I understand coffee is, I really do believe that what we do before first crack establishes the qualities and the structure of the organic flavors and compounds and, you know, acids and proteins that we're changing in the roasting process. You know, if it has inherent citrus or stone fruit or you know, those kind of elements, the expression of those, we really start to develop in that stage. 
and then development after crack or that development percentage number we talk about is about rounding out those intensities you know a longer or shorter will have uh a more muted or a you know more intense expression of those organic compounds that we developed you know prior to first crack um so i really changed my theory in 2017 where i was giving up going for full development percentage and actually stretching out along the roads delaying the first crack on that particular coffee um but shortening the development percent to 10 percent, and at that time that was really foreign for me i was like this coffee's going to be way under grassy i just didn't expect it to to work i was very much trusting um someone who i was working with and my coach and mentor was tetsu who was the previous world champion um we established a, a dialogue and you know i'm all about collaboration and working with great minds and he really allowed me to shape i guess my filter direction moving forward that that we can think about things a little differently um so that was that approach uh, it was only one time i, I roasted it. i basically had to get on the plane and serve it because uh that's all i had um others very similar for example agonesca when i prepared her coffees i had i think yeah it was two roasts and basically for the competition all of it was being used i think i got two roasts of eight kilos uh, and again it was one of those things just you know hold your breath use your experience trust your gut and react to what happens um you know be focused and, and aware um different approach if we talk to some of the coffees we worked on um when i was helping uh in 2021 for for matt uh winston and and his campaign in brewers cup um obviously that brings us to you know some of the earlier developments on 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 the link and the customized nano that we'd made for that one that was more of a thing where we were back and forwarding and then we had i think maybe two kilos of each lot maybe less I, it was not a lot of coffee and then you know four days out we're just like let's just let's just roast it all we're happy with this profile and then you know work on our techniques to get it to get it out there um so that one was kind of a little bit more and i think the beneficial in roasting in smaller bat sizes that allowed us to really refine the expression um which i think the magic of being able to do it in 100 grams and at the location itself was was really incredible um because you know often when you go to a competition you are traveling an extended amount of time with coffee you know that goes under a cabin that ex experiences different changes in environments and temperatures and, and sometimes that degrades from from the coffee uh roast uh i'll give you a great example of, of what happened in, in that scenario is hugh kelly which is another um competitor in honor uh, he's competed many times at the world uh in 2017 also he was in the barista comp he used a version of the same coffee that i had prepared for uh brewers cup and day one and day two, he had, you know, he was number one in the world, number one in the world, uh, you know, great performance, incredible, you know, coffee. And unfortunately, the last day, just in preparation and roast and the time, the age, like we knew the coffee didn't have it. When, when he needed it the most, not being able to prepare it in the moment and have a redo, he, his coffee just lacked and, you know, still had an amazing result. We're super proud of him, but it was just unfortunately we couldn't we couldn't do anything in that space so you know many different approaches that 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 we do have and and different techniques i think modern day we're able to do more in the moment rather than in the past um yeah. and make the most out of smaller amounts of coffee yeah you mentioned before um in the campaign of, of Matt Winton, you've been working with the with the Cafe Logic, which then became also the Nucleus Link. Yeah, what was what was was kind of the the problem or the motivation? Why you because you're you're kind of the the, the mastermind or or the man behind the the Nucleus Link as it's standing now in front of us. But yeah, why did you come up with this? What was kind of the problem that you saw as a, as a roaster or as a trader? Yeah, there's there's, there's this is going to be a two part story. So, so the first part and the idea behind it, and I'll give you some context, is 
I was moving away from the base in Canberra, um, moving up to Sydney um, to be with my partner. Um, and I needed, obviously, a way to prepare samples and continue my work. Uh, I'd been an advert fan for a long time of gas drum roasted coffees. Uh, as much as I love the convenience of fluid bed and the transport that you can have and moving around, I found that for me, at least, however I approached them in the past, they were a very volatile and unstable roast where they were amazing for a short period of time, but they tapered off very quickly uh, in expression um, or they were incredible, but they didn't quite have the body and the sweetness that I really resonated with for my particular taste preferences again my taste preferences are my taste preferences and you know we'll leave it at that um but i was aware that you know i need a solution if i'm making the effort to move away from my base i do need a a way in which we can prepare the coffees uh at that time i had also one of the baristas i'd worked with in amsterdam was also john gordon um working on these coffees uh with him and he was in collaboration with a pop-up or a startup Kickstarter, as you'd call it, with um, team members in in Cafe Logic, and he's like, "Hey, I know you're in the market. You really should give these guys a go." Um, and for me, it was one of those things that I think they'd been on the market for two or three years. That hadn't been, you know, they were emerging, and there was some hobbyists using it, but I don't think they'd really been given the fair light that they deserved. And I was like, "Look, you know, I'll give it a go." Uh, when I got the machine. I realized that the work that Chris and the team had done in terms of the engineering and, and the capabilities were pretty impressive. I was like, you can get an incredible roast out of this. The issue is the handling, the some of the firmware stuff, some of the understanding, you know, from a user who may not be able to use it uh, super effectively that, that we can make some refinement. Um, so I went back to them and, and I think the thing that really drew me into this is it was so much lower price on the market than anything. And I think that the price itself made it hard to take seriously. Um, but I was like, look, to me, this opens opportunity because one thing which I'd been obviously starting to get a little chip on my shoulder with being involved yearly in the competition circles was the sheer expense of competing, the resources needed, the amount of coffee you need to acquire. It, it really did mean that someone with, more resources was more likely to do well and i think that for a competition that's designed to celebrate someone on their skills not what they have i think that i was looking for a change behind that so you know for me i, I came up with a pitch to the team i'm like look let's let's work together right now you have great engineering minds and softwares but, you know i'm not going to say I've, I've designed your product but i have coffee experience i've worked in these you know with several people i've got you know ability to get good data like can we work together on ideas to improve your current version uh and and our whole goal was not anything more than i wanted to produce great quality i wanted that unit at its price point to be able to produce great quality and my testament of how do you test the quality is being uh that's coming off that unit is great is well have someone utilize coffee prepared or at least pass of their coffee prepared on the world stage and get the feedback as as i said like one thing we shouldn't be scared of is, is feedback and from that any feedback you can get is is valuable uh after nine months of refining with them back and forwards you know an old team member of cafe logic which, which is wayne burrows He's a friend of yours as well, I believe. Like we spent countless hours and 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 very long days back and forwards working on improving the system. It was very, you know, we worked our daytime jobs, you know, and then in the evenings and the late hours we would. This was a hobby project. It was it was no big thing behind it. it was more, you know, can we do this together? Like it was, you know, with the full support of the team, but it was kind of also something that was like never really officiated to be anything more than an experience or an experiment refine the project back and forwards on the improvements my feedback i want this can it do this can you make the 
system do this. I need you to be able to unlock this. Can we have this feature? I want, I want this. And I, I did a lot of asking. I'm sorry, I'm Chris and the team for the, for the demand. And they were like, oh, is it worth it? This guy just asked, asked, asked for more, more, more. Um, and I was like, and then again, there was no plans to commercialize what I was asking for. I felt like, why are we spending all this time on, on something? And then I was like, look, you know, let's just see. I just want to push the capability. It's almost like a car company or, a, you know, Renault or Ferrari wanting to do something Formula One, like you manufacture everyday cars. I want to produce something that's tailored for pure excellence and, and the best out of the tweaking that, that we can do. Um, we got it to a point, you know, obviously collaborated with independent um, barista who was looking for support. Um, you know, met with the model, had a great story, really connected, and and we we went from there. Obviously, remembering it was COVID times, we couldn't connect in a room. So the first time we came together was four days before the comp, um, stripped everything back, uh, and started to build a performance. You know, in three or four days, that that was the new one with you know how we were approaching copies and just trying to get the best out of it. And I honestly thought that that experience would take me three or four years to even have anyone make a finals, let alone, you know, have copies roasted off this unit that would be celebrated as that year's best expression. Um, so that was, you know, that initial part of the development was on quality. Uh, we went away from Milan, super stoked. The team was so proud. I think the thing for me, which made it all special was, was not myself. Like I'm a pretty, uh, quiet and shy person i don't like the front spotlight in anything i like to achieve figure out what's going on and then fade back into the shadows because that's where i feel more comfortable behind and tinkering than than speaking but for me the proudest moment was just the joy success and pride of that brought the cafe logic team to know hey we're not you know a domestic pop-up unit or a kickstarter or you know we, we can produce something to be to be serious uh, but we were lost, like, you know, they have a model on the market right now, you know, the features and the way in which I was profiling was, was quite difficult that it would take quite an experienced user to utilize this machine, um, and utilize the profiling and how it would work. So it wasn't really part of the demographic they were working on. So we kind of put it to the side, like it's not going to be anything more than just an experience. Uh, I put that unit in my backpack and as I said, I do a lot of, I put my buying hat on, went to origin, um, went to the farms and, and that's when I realized something kicks. Like I'm that kind of person that I like to help out. I don't want to do a farm visit and just rock up in the cup and, you know, walk away and eat their food and be in time. I, I want to be in there with them helping it. Like it's a privilege for me to be able to enjoy their coffees. Uh, and you know, so I'd open up like, Hey, I've got a roasted can we roast i'll roast your samples like you go and enjoy dinner i'll stay in the hotel and i'll roast, roast the samples um and from that experience i realized like some producers were amazed that their coffee could taste that way they've never tasted their own coffees how we in you know a buying country or, or a cafe setting or or, or a, a cupping thing would experience their own quality so to me that was a really amazing experience and then the second thing was Whenever there was a failed sample, if they'd already prepared the roast, I was like, hey, I've got the roast up. Why are we roasting? This is how it works. We can taste it straight away after. You know, give me the green and I'll make sure I give you a fair and honest feedback. Uh, and that way that that coffee, their hard work, the 9, 12, 11 months, whatever it was to produce that coffee from a you know, seed to, to cup, it was valued. We actually gave honest feedback for, for what we were able to assess. Uh, and it wasn't just me brushing it off as your quality is not worth it because it didn't taste good on a cupping table. And I think that experience made me realize the importance of cupping and sample roasting and that transaction that it's not something that should be for those who are privileged and understand roasting. It's not like we're competing on, I can roast this coffee better than you. It's a simple rudimentary function that's so important within our industry that if we don't do it well, it can give a completely jaded experience of someone's livelihood and product and their hard work. And for me, it kind of gave 
I guess the birth of the link purpose is I want someone who is focused on fermentation and agriculture to be able to experience and showcase their coffees with pride as good as someone who doesn't know anything about coffee processing but knows how to prepare a green coffee sample. I'm like, we need that ability that regardless of your skill set, if it's important to your position or uh, role in coffee, you have the ability to produce a great cup of coffee. And I think that really set the link journey in motion. I came away from that, um, you know, talked to the Cafe Logic team. Uh, at that stage, it was still just myself. Like I had no company or, or backing to, to produce it. It was still on like, can I figure this out? You know, how do I put my brain in the way in which I think about coffee into a digitalized version that can make that decision making for someone who who doesn't know but also the way in which i think if people know me well is quite complex it's kind of weird and i, I can often be confusing so i was like i need to make it really streamlined and rudimentary uh from that process not only where we were refining the firmware the software and how it worked but i was like i need a compass to be able to allow people to navigate through my mind and my thought process um the best thing that you can do in this and what i've always said from the beginning is you need data data is has the keys to what what we need so thank god i was a little bit uh uh, particular about capturing every roast that i would do you know volume by weight densities the moisture content humidity altitude country uh, who grew it, where it was grown, what farm, what variety it was, uh, what was the water activity, and then you know everything that I could assess from the green side, and then everything that I could then assess from the roasted side, like what time did that coffee crack, what was the cracking temperature, you know what was the right profile within the system that worked, what was the development setup that worked, um, was there an optimized you know range that that worked. Did I enjoy this sample? Did I not enjoy this sample? Um, which gave me this huge pull. And, and as I said, like we were doing a lot of roasting because I was trying to figure out how do I make this system easy. Um, at that time, we were developing profiles and profiles and profiles, you know, based on all of the different coffees. I was trying to ask, like, give me the weirdest coffees that no one roasts because I want an answer for those. Um, so we developed out all these profiles and then it was just me tinkering one night. As I said, a lot of it was done after hours with, with, you know, people who, who were interested in it. And I, I started to see a pattern. I was like, what are all of the successful roasts that I said, yes, this was a good expression of this coffee. And, and within that, one thing I realized is for this particular unit and the purpose of sample roasting and cupping, there is a certain optimized time range that we have profiles done under and when i do that optimized time frame and i have it cracking at this point with these development parameters that is a good coffee so then i had something tangible to draw on okay that's my ideal scenario i want that result but then how and why did that work what in the green data taught me that that profile at that cracking point and under that finishing time worked And what I realized is there was four data points that started to correlate. Uh, And those data points gave me pretty accurate, and this is goosebumps. Like I'm telling you, like I, I felt electric when I saw the pattern. I'm like, surely, surely this is not like, it's like stumbling across, like, like, yeah, stumbling across like the Holy Grail. I'm like, this cannot be genuine that, that this pattern actually works. Um, and it was the fact that like most importantly was this what I would call volume by weight. Uh, volume by weight density is essentially for a select volume of, of, of millage, the weight of what will fill that, that vessel. Uh, it's a very rudimentary measure, but it's very inexpensive. It's, it's easy and in in some degrees, it gives you a data point. The interesting point about that is it's only relevant if everything's done on the same measure. And thank God, because I was roasting such small amounts, the measure which I was using needed to be small because we're talking 100 gram samples. So 
everything was done in the same tube. Uh, the original version of that was this little gold tube that that I, I didn't even know why where I'd got the first version of it. But every sample, the five or six thousand samples that we, you know, I built out the data pool from the beginning, I'd always measured in that tube. Uh, and from that, that number was a really strong correlation when I put that against the process of the copy, the variety of the copy and the humidity of the copy that would tell me within the optimized time range that I'm trying to roast in when that copy was going to crack with certainty of between, you know, I'm going to say 30 seconds, but it's more around that like 10 to seven second mark, which I could predict before I roast that copy. Uh, and to me, that was like, wow, like with that, I can have people get a starting point where you can weigh these points in, put it into a, a you know, a graph or a system. And from that, it's going to tell you, this is the best starting profile to give you a first reference. You know, first profile might not be perfect, but it's going to be right within the box. That's going to give a fair and honest expression of that copy. I think for me, it was like fair and honest expression was what I was wanting, that it just represented the organic compounds of that coffee accurately uh, without it, you know, giving a jaded interpretation that roasts may play an issue in it. Um, so figured out this is a system that I can use. Obviously, I mentioned that humidity is also very important. The reason I chose to disclose or remove that from the solution is my whole idea was to make it more accessible. If we needed to buy more expensive equipment, it started to then make it not as relatable. And it would also mean that people would need the same equipment. I was looking for equipment that was able to be scaled, but it was also inexpensive um, for its you know, value. Uh, and then from the first data points uh, already, I could actually turn off variety as a process. People will see within the app and there's obviously questions within the app I end up writing like, why is variety there? I'm going to bring it back in an update. But for now, the solutions were so close to being almost perfect first go that adding that priority in, in was not necessary. I could actually do it off a two priority system. Um, then the idea was like, how do I write the app? So I know me and, and and another gentleman, I was like, I've got to write the algorithm. Everything was done as a Excel based solutions. Uh, and I would code it and work on it and rewrite it and figure it out and back and forwards. Like, can the solutions work? This one didn't work. What did I do wrong? This, you know, is changing. This is changing. Cool. Had everything ready to go. Happy, uh, wrote the first algorithm manufactured a, a 110 volt unit and then i realized that the power that hurts the voltage because that's our supply of heat completely changed the solutions so i had to then go back and write a completely new solution system just for a different power source um and within that you you know once we got the the app working and you know the power source the other things that come to mind is okay frustration in roasting is we, we talk about portability. Portability isn't putting it in a case and being able to move it. Portability is that you can have that unit and it prepares the sample the same way where you take it. And one massive challenge that we, we came to was the effects of altitude and air density. And as you say, our, our roaster is air-driven and most fluid bed roasters, you know, have always faced this market. Like, you know, if we want true unit to unit profile sharing, our calibration from factory is really important. Um, with the links, particularly, we developed a custom calibration system um, to make sure that the units themselves, one unit to another, was almost identical duplicate of how it would behave. It was a very, you know, rigorous process. You know, the team within cafe loads like it takes them sometimes 30 minutes to just get one machine calibrated perfectly it's not a quick met a, a quick process they need to continually continually do it and i was like we spend so much time getting that calibration point specific for link and how it works and then to have someone alter that calibration point in order to, for their environment completely undoes all the work that we've had to have a system that's standardized that people can use everywhere so 
lingering on my shoulders is how do we attack? Uh, how do we check altitude? How, how, how do we combat it? How does someone in Bogosar at 2000 meters use the same profiles as someone in, you know, Sydney at sea level? Um, so that was a fun and, and interesting exercise. Um, I can go into that. That was a, that was a seven week, uh, forty five farms, seven uh, five countries, adventure, uh, to 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 write that one. And you know, I thought I had it cracked, and it's kind of like that thing you think you have the answer, and then another challenge amounts that when you go up, the compounding effect of air density it increases. It's not standard in the lower altitude; it actually compounds and gets more. Uh, the smaller amount that you go up, the larger the effect. So then factoring that into algorithm was was pretty pretty fun. Uh, but what we ended up, you know, developing and, and once we tested it and we took it to all those scenarios to make sure that hey, if I'm telling you that this has worked, like I'll do it myself. You know, I'll go there, I'll spend the time away to actually make sure it it, it, it does work and why I'm on the road, I can rewrite the updates because you know, and, and relay that back to who I'm working with, you know, from development or, or, or the app to be able to, to update my solutions. Um, and one thing which I think was, for me, like, amazing is we'd written in this fan speed trim that you could temporarily change the calibration to your location and save it. And I developed, obviously, all the profiles when I'd initially written wrote them was in Sydney and I took a profile that I'd written in Sydney designed for a hundred gram batch to a farm called um, uh, Santa Teresa 2000 in Costa Rica uh, altitude I think at that time you know this is the first high altitude roads I'd done because they had a great mill height that was around 2300 if I'm not mistaken meters above sea level put the coffee in altered the batch size change the power because obviously we're running on 110 voltage and push play and i was like look you know if this works and this successfully follows the thing it turns the coffee correctly the volume of air passing through is correct then i'll be confident to say that we actually have a form of portability that you can take this roaster whether it's at sea level or or above you know you have the ability to take that with you and i think the importance of that is when we roast coffee, we're not always in a beautiful cupping lab and perfect scenario. Sometimes we've got a PowerPoint sticking out from an extension cable and we're in a, you know, tin sheltered thing where where this is where coffee comes from. If if you travel to farms, like this is the reality of coffee. We don't have these perfect environments. So we need a way in which you can have some standardization, some system that can cope with where we're going to take coffee and where we want to prepare it. Uh, as I said, I know I spoke a long time. I can I can tell you thousands more stories like this because it's 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 a deep detail. But these are some of the things that, that we've we've thought about. Um, it's not trying to recreate something that we already have. It's trying to address these are real challenges. We are facing these, uh, and then what is the solution to be able to fix it? Um, when it came to the link, like our solution was. I don't want to, you know, the hardest thing and the expense in anything comes with hardware. The more detailed the hardware, the more expensive the materials, the more extensive, expensive, sorry, the unit will then eventually cost. But what is inexpensive is your time to develop something digital. So if you put your resources towards digital data, towards refinement of software, the refinement of, of firmware, and as I said, like the Formula One team, you've got a standard engine that you're looking to get maximum performance out of and capabilities. I really do think the potential is endless. Like, and that's what excites me about is that we want to extract together with the team that's now obviously supporting this. There's a big, you know, network of of Cafe Logic members like, you know, Chris and Rich and 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 Sean, you know, that are in my team and myself and Jerome, you know, on our sides now collaborating with ideas, like putting our collective energy towards it to to further refine the tuning of this. Like we're giving the feedback that we want as where the drivers, them as the technicians and the engineers putting their efforts and resources into um, allowing what we're requesting to be, you know, to be realized. Uh, 
And I think the cool thing about this is it's not just myself now who's working on this. We have a huge network of, of great coffee producers and baristas uh, celebrating the system and embracing it and not just using it, but contributing to the improvement, which I think is really cool. Like it's, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine that I would have something and be working with, you know, some of the farmers I am and getting their data to improve the system and, and it, them coming to me and saying, wow, well, like this is making my life better. I'm like, well, you're already so famous. You're already so successful. Like how is this? And it's like, well, it's allowed me to realize, you know, what I can do and, and focus more on my coffee techniques over, over, you know, spending more time behind the roaster. So yes, that's super rewarding as well. And that's something I realized when we were together in Athens at the, at the Nucleus booth, that there were a lot of baristas, but in particular, a lot of all those really great producers and, and really like famous quality driven producers that uh, came to your stand and were talking to you and were obviously already using the link since quite some time. Yeah. And that's also something I thought because you, you said like it was one sentence a bit earlier that many of the producers, they don't even know about the coffee they produced. And what I like about the link is kind of, if I'm listening to you, it's, it, you could have written a, a book or I mean, more than a thesis, even like a big book about all the data that you've collected and all the insight that you, um, gathered during developing the link. And at the end you put it in this machine and made it in a way that, yeah, anybody can, um, just take the machine, use it really simply without any knowledge and then do a nice coffee. And I think this could be probably something that's going to change the coffee world quite a lot. If the producers now um, have the access to, to a machine, which is also not too expensive, can roast their coffee and finally understand what they're, what they're producing. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And, and as I said, like for me, that was the most valuable thing is it's not just in the quality, it's also in the efficiency uh, mm. of, of what you can do. And right now, you know, if we want efficiency, we look at timing, batch to batch protocol, and what you can get off a roaster um, is, you know, it, it is spending more time. You know, it's part of the reason that, you know, Cafe Logic based systems and the link utilize the, you know, no drop temperature roasting. And that's batch to batch protocol. It makes it quicker if we don't need to preheat the roaster in between batches. It gives amazing so benefits to how soon you can taste the coffee. But also within that system, part of what we were looking to achieve is uh, efficiency that if I could start and finish it, I could roast, you know, five to seven batches in an hour. If I could make it a more affordable unit, instead of me only roasting five of the seven batches, we could scale it like you would have your old uh, Probatino four drum, you know, gas burners that you could have four links uh, side by side. You could be running them in a completely automated fashion where you're only listening for crack if you're an experienced user. You don't need to listen for crack if you're not because it'll just give you an average development percentage and it actually allows you to do other stuff. And it means that your process, instead of someone who maybe misses a step or that coffee's challenging, it gives it a, a direct expression that you can actually scale it up. It's also part of the yeah. reason why the roaster itself is not entirely needed to be connected to the computer we have the digital version for those who like to see what's happening from a roast um, perspective and from you know live roasting which is also a big thing that we look to bring in with this with this model but also everything's internalized in a mode that we call analog that every function that you do in the digital space and what you see on your computer is able to be done directly from the unit and I think what's nice about that is, as I said, we're looking for resource-based, um, uh, limiting the need to buy more things that unless you're doing an update or a software base, like everything's internalized in the unit. It's completely remote. You can take it up into the mountain where you don't have Wi-Fi. And as long as you've got it, it's all loaded in there, like you can run everything that you would as if you were connected. Uh, and I think that that makes it scalable for many units. Um, and, and as I said, like I could, some of the people who, who have been so gracious to adopt the, the unit and contribute, um, all thanks to them, um, because it, it really helps, you know, I could, I could list a few great producers who have been really beneficial and, and baristas in, in this process, um, to allow me, you know, to be there and, and roast their coffees with them. And then, 
from that actually implement the link system into their own uh, their own protocols and and get benefit from it. Yeah, nice, nice. One aspect I would like to to talk about is um is um this possibility to immediately drink the roast uh, mm-hmm. out of the roaster because this is something that uh, usually hardly anybody in coffee roasting is really believing because we know coffee needs to rest and if I'm talking about this feature um, everybody's a bit skeptical about it but at the end even I mean you proved it like uh, the, the current bird barista champion um, his coffee I think you you roasted it about or three days before before the world championship yeah. before yeah. you went to stage so it's kind of working and can you tell a bit how how you found how f- you found this possibility and maybe elaborate a bit on on how it can be used in, in daily yeah. use so this isn't something that we had it set out and discovered this is just purely something that was discovered after the fact as i said batch to batch protocol and efficiency was you know part of the reason why the link system and the cafe logic system, they do not have a preheat. Um, the amount of thermal energy that you need to get into a coffee uh, with at least the batch size to the available power that we have is we have greater available power than what we need to have enough thermal mass convection in order to get it to that end point in a set amount of time, which means that we don't need to do the traditional way of preheating. Um, Many people have heard this analogy from me in the past, but when we, you know, we do a traditional roast and the reason that we are preheating is to get some form of kickstart or slingshot momentum into the profile that we actually get a, a start so that we can end the coffee at the time frame that's not going to draw out because the conduction time needed for the amount of heat that we're trying to apply is not possible. So generally we drop the coffee, hot environment, cool or room temperature product it equalizes out the coffee turns and we start the roasting process um within that and this is again as i said a theory of mine someone's got a better view of it i would love to hear but this is at least how i understand it and interpret it is it's almost like cooking a steak you know when we cook a steak we have a hot environment we have a colder product and when you apply that to the hot environment the outside almost seals and sears and has the penetration of heat more on the outside before it ever penetrates the center. In the process, you're also trapping in some of the juices, which makes steaks, you know, to those who eat them, delicious. Um, but it also means that because we're sealing, I think in some ways, the structure of how tight the porous nature of the coffee bean is together, or uh, we actually have a slower release of CO2. Um, it's my belief that by having a no charge uh, system where we're starting the coffee and the green, sorry, the coffee roaster and the green together, there's a homogenization of heat transfer. When we heat the unit up and the coffee, it actually heats it up simultaneously together. And it's almost like more of what we would experience of a sous vide style heating application where internal and external seems the same penetration of heat because it's coming together uh, at the start and i believe that something in that process leaves the coffee beans a little bit more porous so that means that when it's generating that large amount of co2 which is obviously in the roasting phase when we're developing the most of it not as much is actually being trapped into the coffee beans themselves and straight off roast when we're approaching these samples for for cupping or for filter even for espresso uh, we have coffee that has less of that trapped CO2 in, in the beans that's not needing to be broken down or fractured to expose more surface area in order to have that degassing process because the coffee itself is still degassing. And I think the thing about that which really surprised me is it's not just this coffee has less CO2 off roast and has less CO2 which shortens the ageability of the coffee. These coffees still behave the same way. They just have less CO2 presence in perception of taste uh, than than what you would traditionally have off, off a coffee. And I think opportunity of this space system is amazing because then it allows us as an industry to stop roasting, which is something that happens in the past several days beforehand before we can enjoy it and bring it front and center and actually make it a part of 
maybe future coffee experiences or how cafes are interacting with coffee or even changing the service. You think about you're spending over a hundred euro or a hundred US dollars a pound on a coffee and you have to roast a kilo of that and you're probably only going to sell one or two beverages a week or a day if you're a really busy customer. You know, as soon as you turn that coffee product from green to roasted, the diminishing quality is much faster and which is degrading, which means, you know, if your minimum amount you would roast in the past is, is a kilo or you have to roast it all and then you have to do freezing techniques and invest in, you know, those things um, to preserve it in order to get value, it, it makes it less sustainable to run that coffee. But if you have a system where it's almost roast to order, you prepare it in smallest batch size you need if you want to do 50 grams you can do it 51 or 100 grams at the top end and then serve it to that it allows you to control the process of how you can serve and maybe change the coffees or you can bring roasting as part of your experience that people and i don't know if you ever had it ingo but i've had it you know customer knowledge of what coffee is is sometimes limited you have people thinking that coffee comes brown in a sack roasted you know, the fact that it's a green product and it's agricultural base and you've got all these wonderful farmers, you know, behind it, I, I think having people that that understanding and bring it forward can, can have massive uh, value in what mm. we do. So. Absolutely. And I think that's also beauty about that. I mean, if people are getting more into coffee roasting, also understanding the differences um, that are within, within green coffee. And I think we could probably talk for hours now also about, about green coffee, but um, maybe I want to, um, to end this session also um, once, once I have you in, in front of me in, in this recording, get a little bit into tips or hacks or, you know, special approaches, approaches on the machine. If, if, if a person now has a, a link roaster or maybe also cafe logic um, yeah. roaster, because you know, this machine so well, and of course uh, you developed all the systems with the app so that people can find the profiles, but maybe there is on top of that, like, so some cherries or some things or, or hacks or tips that you could yeah. give people in addition. Um, yeah. Yeah. Get kind of all out of the machine. Of course. So I think it's one of those things. The link system is designed for the person who knows nothing about the coffee, but I've also yeah. managed or hopefully manage to write lots of Easter eggs in there for the experienced user as well. Like I see a purpose of it being all, or, you know, all, all values of, of coffee professionals, whether you know, and you've been roasting for decades or it's your first time. I think one of the features of the link, which is really misunderstood is the advanced dial in feature, uh, and, and what that is within the app, um, for people's understanding, you know, the way in which the solutions generally go in the recommendations, 80 to 90% of the time, the first suggestion is pretty much right within the money window. But hmm. let's say you have an anomaly where for whatever reason, your copies are normally cracking for that profile pack. And if you read the user manual, you'll know, let's say you're using the D pack, that the desired crack time is between, let's say, 5 minutes 50 and 6.05. For whatever reason, if that coffee cracks at five minutes 40, you know, you can log first crack, DTR kicks in, you have the right development percentage. It's a quicker roast than maybe what's ideal for that particular pitch and structure of that profile pack. And the idea behind the advanced dialing function is, you know what, I think it would be a overly bias or, or, or confident claim to say one roast and it's perfect. Like I was like, look, you know, but... I would say the reason I did that is within two rows, I can get you closer to a perfect rows. And understanding how that system works, essentially, you know, what you would do is you select the profile that you use and you enter the cracking point of what happened for that profile and the, the, the profile pack that you use. And from that, I've written an algorithm that thinks because everything's based on it all gelling up together and optimize roast time and optimize cracking point and optimize development percentage and optimize increase. If for whatever reason you're in the box with the initial suggestion, but you're in the lower part that you're applying too much energy. So it's cracking early or you're in the later box that you actually could utilize a little bit more thermal energy throughout the, 
starting part of the roast and, and the pitch of it in order to make it crack in a more optimized time range for the how the profile setup. That feature in itself will give you the suggestion based on the last data point it doesn't have. The data points are essentially predicting, you know, initially when it's going to crack in temperature and suggesting a profile. But by having that last data point, um, which is that the cracking point, the advanced style in function can maybe suggest up or down a better better profile. Um, generally speaking, you know, for every five seconds discrepancy from the target, it's a 0.5 step in the profile numbers. A lot of people have always asked in the profile numbers what they mean. One is a sequential skew code for the algorithm to work. Um, but to the reason they step in 0.5 is I've got enough of a variance of like when you're five seconds out, you go to the next one up or down. I built it to be able to compensate and think that, you know, you can utilize that feature. So I would definitely encourage people once they get more familiar with it, they're happy with their roast. If they're not just roasting one sample and cupping it and moving on, but they're actually looking to perfect something, utilizing that feature is going to allow them maybe to see a better suggestion than the initial one. The initial mm-hmm. one's always going to give them an honest expression, but I would say that sometimes, you know, based on those inputs, the second suggestion from the advanced style in is, is going to give them, you know, a more closer to the perfect gross, uh, which I think, you know, is definitely underutilized and maybe people don't quite understand because, as I said, there's layers to this onion and I keep on adding layers yeah. into it. Um, so that would be one definitely act that I would say utilize that feature more if you're repeating a coffee. Um, some other, you know, elements which we're working on in terms of the unit is if anyone, uh, is experiencing like any connection issues, um, where initially the USB tether, uh, is not connecting, uh, the best thing to do is run the unit with no coffee in, um, in it, let it do the heat too fast trigger, you know, unplug the tether, turn it off, hold in the play button, turn it back on, which resets it and plug back in the tether and continue to hold it. And you'll notice that it will connect straight away. Um, that is something that we've also addressed and fixed in the uh, newer updates of the firmware. But if anyone's running old firmware, why we're getting to that point, um, that's just a little, little thing within the system. Um, other aspects, like I think I would love to do some uh, videos with you on profiling. I think that the system itself and why I put so much emphasis on the fact that we've done the profiles is there is so much detail to those profiles. Um, but I would love to be able to maybe understand a little bit more what some of those details are. So, you know, you can take a link profile extract it from log and edit that to custom your you know paste and then save that into your user inbox like this is not a dictating system that you only use it how we've intended to use it the v2 update is going to allow you further customization of the profiles from development percentage and etc but i would like people you know who are maybe developing something on we're trying to give you the framework a framework of a good quality roast and from that make your own expressions, you know, share those profiles, like play around with them. We want you to, to have the ability to, uh, to do that. And, you know, my, it is my goal to allow the system, you know, people understand more about it so they can, you know, make possibly, and I would say most likely even better solutions and roasts than I would be able to create myself. We have an amazing coffee community who's, you know, once they understand something, they can create great, great things. So, you know, I would, I would like more users to have that functionality as well. Nice. Nice. Hey, thanks a lot, Sam. Thanks for, I mean, first of all, for developing that fantastic tool, that fantastic roaster, putting all your uh, knowledge, experience and uh, passion within them. That tool that now uh, is here for, for all of us to use. Thanks for sharing all that you shared in this, in this video. I, I'm, I would like to pick up this, you know, like the offer to go a bit more into profiling in another video with you. And maybe um, if people have um, some more questions uh, that we can elaborate on or some more details they want to know about the machine, write it in the comment. Yeah. But inside of that, um, I just 
really want to thank you for everything, Sam. And uh, it was fantastic, fantastic to have you here. That's it. I hope this video was helpful for you. If you want to know more about the Nucleus link, then click on the link here. You find a lot of information on our website. Also follow our channel because we're posting a lot about coffee roasting, coffee roasting machines, green coffee. And if you have any more questions, then you can always come back to me. I look forward to hearing from you and you find my contact on roasttravels.com.